our son, uh, Max, who is six years old, uh, loves pretending that he has superpowers. I don't know if you know him kids in the four, five, six, seven, eight range, but uh, this is uh, something that they almost always do. We tell him our kids did. He loves playing uh, superpowers with Zimbali and they're interacting with their superpowers. He particularly like shape shifting, which I've never heard of, but it's apparently quite handy if you need to like, go underneath the door or the keyhole or something and shape shift right through there. Uh, so he sometimes comes up to us and asks us, you know, what superpowers do you want? Or what superpowers do you have to have? And if you don't like give him something right away, he starts, you know, throwing out some of the better ones. There's invisibility, there's a firepower, there's teleporting, there's flying. And uh, I'm trying to imagine myself with all these different superpowers and how wonderful that would be. Um, actually I have a I don't quite have a good imagination as he does, and so I'm trying to think, you know, I have a hard time reading a, a fiction book. Uh, let alone that, imagining myself having like superpowers. Uh, but it is something that uh, he enjoys and is captivated by, even though maybe I'm not captivated, maybe after you get to be 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then onward, it's not quite as captivated to you as it was, was before. And I want to talk to you today about something, or speak from God's word to you, about something very real that's suffering, and that's been a theme to the book of 1 Peter. Uh, the reason I bring up um, the superpowers is because one of the things that the book of Peter tells us is that suffering actually is a superpower. It, 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 it enables something very dramatic and amazing to happen for us. And as we go through suffering, and, and the passage that we're talking about is suffering according to God's will, as we go through suffering according to God's will, it can transform us into completely different people. And that's what we're looking at here today. And the question is, how does this work? How can suffering, according to God's will, transform us as people? Now, if you just take your fists, two fists like this, uh, and it's like you put them out there, like this, you can. Okay, you ever got that? They don't have to be high. They're right there, real close to you. That's more comfortable for you. And you have your fists out here, and then slowly release your fingers from your fists. Okay, well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, suffering according to God's will. It doesn't seem that easy, though. This was now. Suffering according to God's will, suffering will actually be forcing you to let go of something. And I don't use the word forced lightly. If you've gone through suffering, you know that there's a fight that happens. And as you loosen your grip uh, on, on whatever it is that you're holding on to, and we're going to be talking about that today, it allows you then to grip and hold on to something else that's far more important. But apart from suffering, you won't let go. And so suffering's superpower is that it forces us to let go of those things that we hold dear to, to ourselves. And we're talking about those specifically today. So what is it that's in the believer's clasped hand uh, that, have to, that we have to get tried off of? And if we can remember it, we'll always do just this one gesture of holding on and having our, our fingers open like that. And it seems quite simple. But I should tell you that there's a lot of screaming and yelling and uh, crying and feeling sorry for yourself that takes place in this process. There's throwing temper tantrums. I don't know if you experience some of these things, but when we go through suffering, there is a lot of emotions that come out as a part of that. And that's all part of the process. process. But in the end, we will that we will open our fingers because God is doing a work in us. And he will see that that happens because it's perfect work. <clears throat> so how eager are you to experience suffering superpower? <clears throat> I trust as we work our way through the passage today that you will be encouraged as you look at your own life. Maybe think about the times that you have gone through suffering. Maybe you are in the midst of times like that now. You certainly will if you're not currently. Uh, and be encouraged and look at your own life and find that there's hope because God is doing a work in you uh, through this process, the good work, the transforming work, the important work. And in many cases, this is the only way that we'll be willing to go through this process. Let's work over and over prayer. Father, we come to you this morning. We pray that you would transform our hearts as we look to your word. We know that as our hearts are changed, that you can change our conduct, our action, our living, our thinking. Father, I pray that that would be the case today. We open ourselves to your word. We just want you to much prayer. Amen. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 4, 6, which you know, read for us this morning. We'll see in First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, 
being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The verse before that in 3.17, when we looked at last time we were together, it says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be God's will, than for doing evil. So the context is suffering, but, but suffering according to, to God's will or for doing good. And so the next verse says that Christ actually also suffered. He also went through difficult situations, obviously it was according to God's will. And it says he suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So it tells us here that Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself. He was the substitute, he said, the righteous for the unrighteous. He was righteous, he had no sin, but he took our sin upon himself. And he pays the full penalty for man's sin. He says he does that by suffering on the cross, or later he says suffering in the flesh. The spiritual life of man, if you remember, had been cut off back in the fall. Out of sin. And all of his descendants, like him, uh, were also under the same curse as Adam was. We were told, or Adam was told, that when he sinned, dying, you would die. Or the, the process of dying is already done. It's just set in stone, but there's a process. Dying, you will die. And after Adam sinned and the curse was brought on mankind, all men were like cut flowers. These are some flowers that can't be seen. About a week ago, they're, they're on their last leg here in this particular picture. Um, but why is it that they look like this? When they when we first got them and they were delivered to her, she was so happy and thankful that somebody thought of her. There were these beautiful flowers represented these things. And now we're a week or eight or nine days into this, and these flowers look quite a bit different. And I'll tell you, we've already talked about this was a couple days ago because they got worse and worse and worse. And why is it that this happened to these flowers? Well, because they've been cut off from their source of life. And that's what we're told about what happened to us. When, when Adam sinned, mankind was cut off from, from God, the source of life. His spiritual life was cut. And that's the problem that we all find ourselves in. But he says here, but now Christ dies as man's substitute. All of men's sins are placed on Jesus. And Jesus is, was cut off from the Father in our place. We're told that he paid the full penalty of sins by suffering on the cross. And even remember him crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he experienced this on our behalf, and, and he receives this punishment. And then after it was completed, we know that God's wrath was satisfied. And he, Jesus, it says, was made alive in the Spirit. And once and once again, he is restored to a perfect relationship with the Father. No longer is that separation between them. And the mission is accomplished, and God has now made it possible to bring man back to himself. We see in chapter 3, verse 18. So in this one, one verse, we have this very clear gospel message. It says that Christ suffered and died for our sins, and the righteous from the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And this was accomplished by Jesus being put to death in the flesh, but then made alive in the spirit. So as we read this and we think through this about our own life, we understand that if we are not in Christ, then we are like these cut flowers. We might look alive. If you're in your 20s, you might look more alive, and if you're in your 30s, you look pretty alive, and in your 40s, you're looking less alive. If you're in your 70s, maybe less alive. I don't know how it works, but we were like this. If we're in Christ, we're not in Christ, we've been cut off from the source of life. But we all know that it's only a matter of time until what? That we will fade, and we will fade, and ultimately we will die, and we will be cut off from God forever. If we're told something like this in John 3.16, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but the restoration and regeneration. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Only God, it tells us here, only in Christ can be restored to the one who is life, because only Christ is the one who is able to restore us to regenerate and to bring us back to life and faith. The trust is in a time that has happened in your life. If not, uh, we, could, we can visualize our life like pet flowers, knowing what the end will be apart from being reconnected to God through Jesus Christ. Well, Christ suffered so that he might bring us to God. Uh, was his suffering successful or effective? Uh, was his suffering in vain? But we, we can look back or look down this verse where it's getting ahead to 3.22. We get the Lord's message in but we skip down to 3.22. The end of verse 21 says, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has been made alive, he's been brought back to life. Verse 22 has 
who has gone into heaven and he is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So we can know with the emphatic yes that his sacrifice was accepted. Uh, God has restored him to resurrected life. He's been exalted not only to heaven but to the, the, the highest place of exaltation at the right hand of God the Father. We have a man, the God man, who's taken on flesh. He's always going to be a man. And now we find this man at this place of unbelievable exaltation at the right hand of the Father. And if this man has been exalted to this place, then what it is that he offers us is also available. There's a phrase in uh, chapter 3, verse 18, that says, uh, the last part of it says, uh, but being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Talking about Jesus there. We go ahead to chapter 4, verse 6. It says, This is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judging the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. So we have bookends here. We have the, 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 the died in the flesh and made alive in the spirit for Jesus. And then at the end of chapter 4, verse 6, we understand we're coming to a closing of a thought here, where it says the same is possible for man. They also can die in the flesh and be made, made alive in the spirit. They can live in this certain way. Both uh, were in the flesh and died, but then both are, can have the opportunity or are in the spirit. So the theme of our passage today is that positionally, we have died with Christ, but we have been raised to new life with him. And in practice, therefore, and this is what's going to come out to the whole passage, the practice part, therefore, in practice, we should not live from the flesh. That is self-orientated, and that's condemned. Rather, we should live in the spirit, which is alive eternally. So we start out the passage with, with Christ going through this process of dying in the flesh and being made alive in Christ, which is the basis, the foundation, and the, where we have the opportunity to be made righteous as well in Christ. And then as we flow through the passage, and by the time we get to chapter 4, 6, we find out that in practice it should change the way that we live. It should change the way that we think. Because there's a transformation that is happening. We are leaving one, and we're moving into the other. And it says in chapter 4, verse 6, this is our objects. And we have the opportunity to live like God as well. Jesus did not hold on to the preservation of his flesh. In his case, his flesh was perfect, but he still chose to suffer in the flesh for something far greater. And that was to fulfill the will of the Father. And when people came to follow Jesus, he clearly explained to them that he was not going to bring them to things that were going to uh, reward their flesh. He said that he would not bring, he did not promise them great wealth if they followed him. We read some passages this morning, Luke chapter 9, when the communion was being shared. He did not promise them great wealth. He did not promise them comfort if they would follow him as his disciples. He did not promise them security. He told them, when they, they said, we want to follow you, he said, I have nowhere to lay my head. He told them that they wanted to be his disciples, they would have to deny themselves and take up their cross daily, and then ultimately he suffered and he died in the flesh. On the other hand, many of those that Jesus has created have a far different view of what to prioritize in this life. Rather than being willing to suffer in the flesh in order to be obedient to the will of God as Jesus showed us he was, they, these other ones, and we ourselves can be like this also, become completely self-orientated. We become flesh-orientated. That we're eager to turn from obedience to God to feed the passions of our flesh. So we're going to go into a very interesting passage here in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. It's a difficult passage to understand, but he's drawing home this big point of not of, the, of being fleshly oriented and self-oriented or being willing to live in obedience to the will of the Father. In chapter 3, verse 19, he says that Christ was made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So we're told that in the time of Noah, there was this uh, exceeding wickedness that was on the earth. In fact, I'll take you to a couple passages here in Genesis chapter 6. It says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted 
that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. It says every intention of their heart was evil or self-oriented or self-focused or fleshly focused. They were not interested in the will of God. They were not interested in living obedience to him. And they were self-focused. They were wicked beyond our imagination. How did this happen? We go back to the previous verses. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attracted, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty days. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, they were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. That's a difficult passage of scripture. Uh, a number of different possible uh, interpretations, of course, of what it was. Correct interpretation. Uh, we as humans do our very best to, to do to find what that one possible or that one correct interpretation is. I'll just let you know there are other options out there, but I'll share what I understand from this passage. And that is my understanding is that evil spirits, fallen angels, are the sons of God here. And they looked down on earth and they saw attractive women before the daughters of men. And they came down to earth and began, they became engaged in sexual relationships with these women. And they had children by them. And they, these children were great in size and in strength. They were very wicked. And they were only thinking about their own selfish pleasure and their own selfish orientation. And as a result of that, the, the, the life and the people here on earth uh, were exceedingly wicked. Every intention in their heart was wicked. Um, Now, we might have a, a, there's some difficulties with this interpretation, as there are with all the other interpretations, so there would be no conflicts. Uh, but one difficulty with this interpretation that you might think about is that, well, I remember Jesus saying that spirits don't marry or have children. Uh, we do know, however, that they can take on the form of a human. Uh, we also know that they can possess humans. Um, we don't have all the details of what exactly happens here, but in some way, it seems that they were able to interact sexually with these humans, and they, they corrupt the human race. It's a, a terrible situation that happens here on this earth. And this corrupting has influence not only on that generation, but then they have children in that generation. And so you can just imagine the earth that's filled with demonic activity at probably the highest point that has ever been at in the history of, of the earth. And, and these demons, these fallen angels, were a large part of it. Not only were people wicked, but these fallen angels also were wicked. They also were looking up. It says they looked down and saw these attractive women and just went and took them. So they were just thinking about themselves, their own selfish orientation as well. So we have humans and we have these fallen angels. We have them together. We have them having children. Everybody is just focusing on me, me, me. What do I want? And it makes this unbelievably wicked world that we find at that point in time. And so God decides to destroy everything. All the animals, with the exception of two very kind, all the birds, with the exception of two very kind, huge numbers of fish were buried and, and destroyed. The whole world of vegetation was, was buried and destroyed. Almost every human was destroyed, with the exception of one family, Noah and three sons and their wives. It tells us that God was greatly grieved and he poured out his wrath on this wicked world. God condemns and judges those who are willing to, are, are wanting to live according to their own purpose, for their own pleasure, rather than for, them for the purpose that they were created for, to bring honor and glory to God. That was true of the angels. Why did God create the angels? To bring him glory. Why did God create humanity? To bring him glory. And as we look at this pre flood world, we find that they have departed from that. They are exceedingly wicked. They're thinking, we don't care about God at all. We only care about ourselves. We're told in this passage that this was not some snap decision by God, that he saw what was going on and he just snapped and said, I'm killing you all. It wasn't like that. He grieved and told us. And he waited 120 years while at, or while Noah was building this boat to save them. And he gave them time to repent of their sins, to turn from their fleshly passions and self-indulgence. And Noah, we're told, was a preacher of righteousness. So for 120 years, he was telling these people, 
You need to turn from your sins and you need to turn from God. You need to be restored in a relationship with Him. And if you won't, He will punish you. He will destroy you because He always destroys those who go against the plan for which He created them, for the purpose for which He created them. And Noah preached these things that God would provide righteousness, that He would provide a way for them to escape this great destruction that was coming upon themselves, that they would just repent of their sins and they would just believe what He had to share with them. As we know, the flood came. Noah and his family were vindicated, that they were saved. He and his family had a, a fresh new start in this new world with eight people. All the other humans were destroyed. The demonic spirits who were involved with humanity at that point in time obviously weren't struggling to swim. So there wasn't an issue that they, they drowned with the, the humans at that point in time. But God did in judgment take them. And he, he, he puts them into what's called prison. He puts them into a temporary confinement, a holding place for them. And he is punishing them as well. And we see this in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept into the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the rules of ungodly. So here he says that at some point in time there was a group of angels who disobeyed the purpose for which they were created, and God took them and he cast them into hell. The word there is actually a different word than the normal word for hell. It's Tartarus. It's a temporary place of punishment that he cast them into. And they were in this place of captivity as a result of their uh, demonic activity and their self-indulgence and their wickedness and bringing this terrible time upon the earth. And it seems that this is at the same time as Noah, because of what we're talking about here. Um, if we go back to Second Peter, First Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, with these things in mind, I'll read it again. Now Christ, being put to death in the flesh, was made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God in his patience, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So Jesus apparently went and he spoke to these demonic spirits that were locked up. Now, we know that most demonic spirits are not locked up at this point in time. Even during Jesus' life, there were, there were spirits that were, were begging Jesus, don't throw us into the place of, of torment. Don't, don't lock us up. Allow us to continue to be free. So we know that most demons uh, and fallen angels are free to this day. But there are a group of angels that were involved in some kind of sin and it seems like it's a sin here around the time of Noah's flood that committed this, these certain acts and God judged them for that and he threw them into this temporary place of suffering called Tartarus. And now he goes to them and he, he condemns them and, and he, he, they're condemned because they have chosen not to live in the way that he's encouraged them to live or what he created them for. When did he go and visit these spirits? Um, We've got sure for, for, for certain, sometime after his death, and sometime before his exaltation to the right hand of God. Some people think it was between his death and his resurrection that Jesus went and spoke to the spirit that were in prison, uh, which has led to all kinds of, I think, false doctrines that Jesus actually was in hell, or he was preaching in hell, or he suffered in hell. We have no indication that Jesus ever went to hell. Uh, another, others believe that this took place as he was ascending into heaven, which is possible. But in some place in time between his death and between his ascension, Jesus went in his spirit and he spoke to these ones who were in this prison in Tartarus. And what did he say to them? Well, we're not told what he said to them. He said something we think that he said, it seems like, that he was he's going to them to proclaim his victory over sin and evil. They had they had thrown their whole heart and soul into self-indulgence and self-orientation and self-pleasure and those things. And now he was going to, to tell them that no, the victory has been won. There is righteousness that's available. That victory has been won through my work on the cross and through my ascension, uh, resurrection and ascension. And so he tells them that unlike them, he did not please himself. But he was obedient to the Father. That is, they bet against obedience to the Father, and they went to fulfill their own desires. And now he tells them they are eternally condemned, and rightfully so, because this is not why God created them. 
This is still true today. People go and bet against obedience to God, and they bet on going after pursuing their own pleasures, pursuing their own flesh. And we can see here that God has a certain view of that. He will always, always destroy those who live for this own, their own self-orientation. The examples of Christ, an example of Noah, who both suffered for doing good, according to God's will, according to chapter 3, verse 17, that laid out the structure for us that we're thinking about here. They suffered in the flesh, um, but they suffered in doing well in obedience to God. And that what we're learning through this is that suffering in the flesh, while we think it is the worst thing that could possibly happen to us, we find out that it actually isn't the worst thing that can happen to us. God will vindicate those who will suffer in the flesh according to his will, just as he did to you, and just as he would resolve into the highest place under Noah, bringing the truth to the world. And we can expect the same as well for us. If we will be obedient in the midst of the suffering, we can be 100% confident that he will also exalt us for living in obedience to his will. In fact, uh, the Christian life is to be characterized by our prioritizing of the spirit and living in the spirit over living in the flesh. Even if living in the flesh, or even if that means that we are to suffer in the flesh. Okay, well that was a tricky passage of scripture, for sure. And that is something that interests you to certainly go back and look at that. See what the other possible interpretations are, see if they put in the whole flow of scripture and study these things out. But it seems like we have the, the correct understanding here. And then in chapter 3, verse 21, he says baptism, which corresponds to this, what we just talked about, turning right this one, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So now he's using another analogy for us to have before our mind. Remember where we're comparing the flesh and the spirit. And so he's bringing up another analogy. He's brought up Christ already, he's brought up the flower already, now he's bringing up baptism. And and he says here that when believers are baptized, they leave witness behind uh, of, of their old life. So when we baptize somebody, you know, we, we step them over backwards under the water, and they're symbolizing leaving their old life with their fleshly pursuits. And they are raised again to new life, and they are living for the will and for the purpose of God in this new life. They have a new nature that's been given to them. And so we symbolize that, the dying to the old and the resurrection to the new. And so when this happens, where we are, that process, of course, doesn't save us. He says that washing the dirt from our body uh, isn't the salvation, but we are responding in a good conscience to God that we've lived in obedience to Him. We have agreed with Him that we need to uh, repent of our sins and turn to Him. And so in good conscience, we do that, and then we, we die, and we're, we're raised to new life. And through that process of God's uh, death and His resurrection, we're saved. And we're saved. Baptism, water baptism, the symbolizing of that. And so he's telling us another example here, another expression of the same truth that we have died in the flesh and we've been made alive in the spirit. And so, from an analogy perspective, let me kind of tie this together where we've got so far. If we have already left the pre flood world of self orientation, self indulgence, and we've already been delivered to a new post-flood world where we can have a good conscience, how can we go back to living that old type of life? We've actually already seen the whole story. We know how it all plays out. We know the condemnation and destruction for those who are wicked, and we know the salvation and deliverance for those who are righteous. If we have already gone through this experience, how can we in good conscience live like they did before the flood? That life was fixated on self-orientation, and we've already seen that that kind of life leads to death. And if we've already given public testimony of God's saving work through water baptism, there's been a time in your life that you stood up in front of a, a number of other believers, you went through the process, you gave your testimony, you were tipped over backwards, and you came back up. If that process has already happened in your life, and you've already given testimony that you have left that self-oriented life, and you now have a new life in Christ, how can you, with a good conscience, still go back and now live a self-centered, oriented life? Life after you've gone through this public display of baptism. He says, it's not surprising when unsaved people live self-centered, flesh-oriented lives. Look at chapter 4, verse 3. 
So the time that is passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passion, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So it says it's not surprising when unsaved people live self-centered, flesh-oriented lives. And he says it's not surprising when unsaved people don't understand when you don't want to join in them, in with them, in these same things, chapter 4, verse 4. With respect to this, they are surprised that you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So it's not surprising that people who have not been saved or don't understand why you don't want to be a part of this lifestyle. And then he says, it's not surprising when they treat you like you are evil for not supporting them in this fleshly-oriented lifestyle, because that's all they have, that's all they understand living for themselves. And they don't want to be still feel judged by, by you because they are giving into their self-indulgence. So it's just not surprising when they malign you, it says. But you, you are living a completely different life now, dead to the flesh and alive to the spirit. And you know that those who continue to live fulfilling the passions of their flesh will be judged and condemned and will experience the wrath of God for their sin. You know this as a believer, verse 5. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So all people who have ever lived, if they've lived in the past and they're now dead, or if they're currently living, it doesn't matter if they're living or dead, every human who has ever lived will have to give account to God. So it's not surprising that we know these things as believers. But we have a new opportunity. We don't have to live like that, and we should, we should not live like that. And he tells us what has happened and now set us free to live a completely different life, chapter 4, verse 6. For this is why the gospel was preached, to make a break and to make a change and to have a transformation in your life. Even to those who are dead, those who have heard it in the past and now have died, and those who are just, and, and also to those who are living today, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. So he says that there is now a way made known to us as believers where we can live and leave that self-orientated, self-centered life and we can experience life in the spirit. And he tries to tell us that that would then be really living because that past life, we already know what happened. We already know what it leads to. And now we have the opportunity to be to be regenerated, to be reconciled to God, to have a new spiritual life, and to have a real life, to really live. Peter, that's what we hear what the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and also said in their epistles. They say, since it is true that you have, you have died with Christ and been raised with Christ, put off the old man. The old man is obsessed with self. And he tells us, in Paul and John tells us to put on the new man in the nature of Jesus Christ that desires to be obedient to God's will. The old man is fixated on the temporary and the tangible. The new man is fixed on the eternal and the spiritual. And, he, and Paul and John and Peter here are saying, put off that old man, that pre-flood world, that pre baptist world, pre-salvation world. Don't be surprised that there are, there are people that still live in that type of lifestyle because they have not been regenerated. They have nothing but that. That's all they have to hold on to. But put off those things. This is an argument that goes all through Scripture. That since you have died with Christ in things of this world, this world, unclass your fingers from those things. You understand now what we're going with it. He says, because this is not our life anymore, we need to un last our fingers from this, since we've been raised with Christ to live a new life. So that you can, once you unclasp your fingers from these fleshly things, how you do have a new opportunity to reclasp your hands around something that's meaningful and eternal and that will really give you life. Just look at this passage in, in um, First John here. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, and the desire of the eye, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desire, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Paul says something very similar in Ephesians and Colossians. He tells us that we are to be putting off this one type of life and putting on this new type of life. Peter is telling us this exact same thing in this passage of Jesus is playing right here, and he gives us a new additional perspective to that process of putting off and putting on the new. 
And the, the additional perspective that Peter supplies here is in the context of suffering. How is it that suffering plays into this process of putting off the new and being able then to put on the new? It's an unclasping of our love for the world and a reclasping of the eternal. How is it? Well, the truth is that we are not always in a hurry to unclasp and let go of those things that appeal to our flesh that we are holding on to. And not just in the commission, although he mentions many here, sexual immorality, envy, bitterness, deceit, but also he mentions idolatry, the things of the heart. And that is putting the temporary things of this world before God. And we don't want to live, let go of these things. We want security now in this world. We want comfort now in this world. We want honor now in this world. We want dignity. We want acclaim in this present world that we hold on to those things and we don't want to let go of those things. And suffering has a superpower. And suffering superpower is able to pry our fingers off of these things. We have to be weaned away from this self-oriented life of making ourselves the number one priority in our new spirit and, and putting or living in our, in our new spirit and focusing on that. And that's why this is how suffering's superpower comes into action. Suffering reveals the foolishness of what we're acting on to. It doesn't seem foolish. In fact, if you were to put us against the wall, we wouldn't want to let go. But as suffering works its way through our life, we start looking at it different, and we realize that it is foolish, the things that we're clasping onto. We might realize the things that we're holding onto are fleeting and temporary and unworthy the great hope that we're putting into it, and suffering gives us new glasses to see things from eternal perspective. Suffering painfully and effectively flies our fingers off the temporal things. Sometimes it's related to physical health. We value physical health. And then sometimes we suffer physically. All of a sudden we realize I was holding on to this, but it's just temporary. It's fleeting. At the very least, you're going to age. And you're going to lose your physical health. But we hold on to it as the most important thing. Financial security. It's so important that we have this and this and this and our future is secure and sure and this and this. It's temporary. We don't want to let go. We hold on to this is what our hope is in. The only way you probably will let go is suffering. Relationships, even family relationships, we're also temporary. We hold on to them. This is the most important thing. Hopes and dreams which are related solely to this world. We're like, I'm going places. I'm getting there. I think I can make it. I'm just around the corner. I think I'll have it. Security and comfort are also temporary. We put our hope in these many things, and when these things don't go the way we want to, we have a serious about that. Because we're very committed to finding meaning in these temporal things. Many, which I mentioned, are, are good. But they're not to be held on to as a great hope for the meaning of our lives. We are now been set free to live in the spirit the way that God does. If it wasn't for suffering, we often would let go. But God is determined to finish the work that He has started in us. He has found us loving ourselves. Living to please ourselves, this is how he found us. He found us, me, 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 me. This is what I want, this is what I deserve, this is what makes me happy. I don't get this. That's how he found us. And he is going to transform us into the image of his son, who did not hold on to his own glory, but emptied himself, gave his life for us, and has now resolved to place the highest glory in heaven. That is a massive transformation that has to take place in our lives. This is a life work that has to take place in our life. And a lot of that life work has to do with suffering for the will of God that goes on in our lives so that we realize that we are holding on to things that are temporal that won't fulfill us. It says that Christ suffered in the flesh in order to do the will of God. And then he tells us the main 
focus in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, which I skipped over, but here's the verb, here's the action, here's what we are to be doing in this process. We've seen the process that we're going from a fleshly oriented life to a life that's, that's oriented to you know, obedience to God, living in the Spirit, and we've seen that there's going to have to be a process of letting go and being free now to grasp onto something that's important. What is it that God wants us to do in this process as we're going through this? Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, you arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of their time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So he says, arm yourself with the same way of thinking that Christ had. Be done with this self-orientated life. Be done with serving your flesh. Rather, live in the spirit the way God does. Chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus suffered for living in obedience to the Father, and then he was exalted at the Father's right hand. He submitted to God's work in his life. And he asked us to do the same, that we would submit to God's work in our life, that we would be willing to let him unclasp our fingers from the things of this world. And as he does that, and as we live in obedience to him, do you not think that he will reward us for all eternity like he did his own son? The suffering has a superpower. It's like this giant kick towards the finish line for us that we desperately need because we can find ourselves wandering around and focusing on temporarily, temporary, meaningless things. And suffering then comes along and rips those things out of our hands and says, I have something far better to give you. But he has to rip it out of our hands. Because if he doesn't, we'll hold on to our last breath. Chapter 3, verse 17 says, Suffering for doing good is something, or for doing evil is something to be ashamed of. But suffering for doing good according to God's will, that's beautiful because it produces a transformed person. Suffering superpower tries to open our flesh foot. A fleshly, temporary, meaningless muck. I use the word muck because that's the word that Paul uses. Because I no longer have confidence in my flesh. And he talks about all things about his flesh. Good things. What pride he was born of, what education he had, how he was going well in his, in his uh, career, how things are going in the right way. And remember, he says, I count them all but garbage, muck, done, whatever translation you might have, not because they were evil, wicked things, but in comparison to what God had for them, he said they are nothing. So we find something that's actually interesting here. As God does this work in our life, and he's praying these things from our fingers so that we can have the freedom then to grasp onto those things that are eternal and that matter, somewhere along the way, in some of these cases, we actually get to the point that we are just like trying to get rid of this stuff. Get in good stuff. Paul is saying, I am not putting my confidence in this anymore. I don't even want to think about myself or think about these things. This makes me disgusted. I want to just be free to love you, God, and to serve you and to be in obedience to you and fulfill the purpose that which you gave for me. Nothing even comes close to comparison to these things. Suffering superpower cries open our flesh fists with fleshly, temporal, and meaningless but in comparison that is what God prepared for us. And lets us see clearly what is spiritual, eternal, meaningful, glory. You have been through suffering, and you look back at it, you can see this process that was happening in your life. You're seeing from a new perspective. You put new glasses on. Now you see the world in a different way. You see what's important in a different way than what you saw before. There are good examples, and there are bad examples of people who have lived in the Christian life or in the Christian world, I should say, claiming to be Christian. There are some that claim things. And then there are others that live, like we're talking about here. And Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, 17, be careful. Just because somebody says, hey, I'm a Christian leader, or hey, I'm a Christian, watch and see. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples you have in us. He just went through a passage that said, put off God. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples you have in us. For many, this is a bad example, for many of whom I have told you, and now tell you even in tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory, and their glory 
in their shame, with their mind set on earthly things. You will find believers, you will find Christian leaders, and as you watch them, you'll find out they were only living for the things that were of this world and that were fleshly. He says, mark them and do not walk in those paths. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from whom we pray to save the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body and be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things unto himself. He says that you will live in obedience to me, suffer even according to to my will, suffer for doing good. You will believe me and you will live this life. I will exalt you so much I exalt my own son. You remember the book of Hebrews. There's the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. If you read through Hebrews chapter 11 with this perspective that we have right now, you will find that each of these examples, without exception, gave us the flesh of to be able to grab a hold of something that was far more substantial, something that was eternal. And he tells them in that chapter they will be exalted, and so will we if we follow their example. Those are the kinds of examples that we're to follow. People like Noah, people like Abraham, people like the prophets, many of them were, were, were literally killed, sawed in two, stoned. Their children were taken away, their possessions were taken away, they still kept going faithfully to the very end because this was what and he tells us that this is what our hope is to be as well. So if we will follow and live as he tells us, then there may be suffering in this world as a result. There will be suffering as a result. But he also says that he will exalt you just like he exalted his own son. Hebrews chapter 11, we call it the faith chapter. Those are the ones who walk by faith. Mark those, follow their examples, live the same way, and expect to have the same result they do. Or, all the examples of others who have lived for this flesh and see how it will work out for them or how it has worked out for them in biblical history what God said will happen to them in the end. And then choose wisely how they have lived their life. Father, we come to you, we lift these things up before you. Father, I pray that you would clarify these things to us into the whole life process that has been laid out in this passage. It's a passage that um, is, is mirrored in many other places in Scripture as well. This is the truth of your word. Father, we might pray that we might understand these things in our own personal lives, what it actually means for us to live this way. Father, pray that.